cope with. That's that's the key, isn't it? Lots of people think you just got to go all in. It's, it's just not the way. Yeah. Hi, welcome back to another episode of Ask Lattice. This time we're going to go through five questions that you guys have given us on Instagram and we're going to try and answer them one by one and give you the best advice possible that we can offer about training and how to train properly. We always like seeing these questions and comments that you guys out there put to us, whether it's on Instagram or on the Facebook group, because it gives us uh, a method for being able to give out some of our knowledge and uh, experience that we have in the coaching world. And me and Ollie love doing this. Um, and as long as this is useful for you guys and you can kind of give us feedback on the stuff that you enjoy and what you like, that enables us to do this better and better each month. So should we go for question one? Cool. Yeah, so, that's a good uh, one. Question number one, and this is one I really like actually, is the try hard switch. How do you switch on that maximum effort whenever you're climbing. Um, personally, I find this one quite a hard one. For me in my own climbing, it's something that it's taken a long time to get used to, and it's something that does come and go if I don't work on it, but it's a really, really important thing in climbing, which a lot of people don't tend to think about too much. Yeah, yeah, the try hard switch. Um, I've got quite a lot of thoughts about this. I'll try not to go into all of them, <laughs> otherwise I'll get really boring. Um, is the try hard thing I think can be, it's very, you can develop it for sure. I'm really, really convinced about this. And I think it's about spending time with other people who happen to have that ability for the try hard switch. And not everyone has it immediately. And some people have developed to a, a really high degree. And if you can select and choose and observe those people and go climbing with them, it's amazing how much you start to absorb that, especially if you know that you're just as good as another person and you can see them do that switch. And we, we both know when we see it and you think, Flippin' hell, they're doing it. I've, I've just got to dig deeper. And suddenly, suddenly you get it. Yeah, there's been a few partners of mine over the years that can really, really dig deep. And the nice thing is in the role that we do is I've assessed them and I've seen their strengths and weaknesses against my own. And when I know that we're very equal as climbers or sometimes I'm stronger than them and they're able to really pull out the bag and I can't see any movement issues involved, then I know actually maybe I'm not really trying as hard as they are. And that's usually for me is the switch to actually turn on and really go for it. Mm. The other way is just to look at what works for your personality. So what really drives you? Is it that you need to yeah. turn that switch on yourself or is it you need someone else to be around there for you? Um, but try and play on your own mentality to see what works for you. Um, I know that a lot of uh, younger climbers tend to be relatively lazy, let's say. Whenever they're climbing on their own, they're training, they're not too bothered. And then as soon as their peers come around, all of a sudden it kicks in. And that just comes down to that competitive drive. So for me, working with those juniors, I'll always try and get them to be working around those other people that they try to compete with. Um, alternatively, those that don't like competition and prefer to go bouldering outside on their own and avoid the crowds, then I would not, never push them into that same situation. I'd be looking to get them inspired by something to do with their own uh, motivations, a particular problem or move they want to get better at. So it's trying to find that right balance, but what works for you? Mm. For me, it's like Tom said, it's finding someone else around me that's tried harder than I have. And whether it's competition or not, I want to try harder than they do. I think another important element to it, which um, doesn't always get discussed, is that whether it's appropriate to use that try hard switch all of the time. So would it be beneficial to be able to flick it and just go 100% all in every day, every training session? And my feeling is that it's not the right thing to do. I think it's something you want to cultivate and develop and do it sort of intentionally. So really try to sharpen and fine tune that skill to be able to do it at the top end. But I think you also have to be realistic and say, it's exhausting being at 100%, you know, at your true maximum. So if you did that every day, <laughs> I don't think you're gonna be able to achieve that 100%. So back off some of the time, other times go full on. So learn how to switch it on and switch it off. And the same thing for anyone who's gone from a bouldering background into sport or trad, you really need to learn to turn that switch off on the easy parts of the climbing. It's 
it's really easy to over grip and just be trying extra hard but when you should be mostly relaxing and trying to be as efficient as possible mm. so balancing that up is a really key point but experiment with a couple of different methods and see what works for your personality so question number two is um what exercises have the greatest return for the time invested so i think this one's asking about if you had to do anything which exercises give the best results it's a big trick oh it's a tricky one so for me in a bouldering phase i'm going to say board sessions and in a root climbing phase because of relatively struggling with a fear of falling if i don't work on it it would be root climbing a lot so yeah two two key things for me is either actually getting on roots and falling off and trying really hard and getting pumped but more from a tactical perspective and working the fitness and the movement to relax but then the rest of the time i'd be looking at board sessions because personally most fun works your finger strength really well works movement as long as you don't add in any silly rules about staying square on or any of that rubbish and actually works your uh, strength in a really good way. See, I'm going to take a slightly different strategy to you. I like, a, I like a bit of structure. Um, is with this question, I would answer it from the perspective of, I think the greatest return from any exercise is addressing the specificity spectrum. So anything which has a really high degree of specificity, so is looks like and feels like the thing that you're trying to achieve that exercise is very likely to have the greatest returns for the time put in so if you're a bouldering specialist something which looks and feels very very similar to what you're trying to achieve on rock or on competition and likewise for root climbing so i would i, I like to be yeah be like i like to be systematic that i would take one element would be the specificity and then the second or the the contrast to it would be if you deal with that and you take that approach, you also have to be mindful of at some point there will also be some, I guess you could call them big holes in your repertoire or your conditioning or skill set where eventually you'll have an amazing return for time put in. If you're, you know, those things that we see where some people have a huge hole in their strengths mm. or their fitness or their technique and they could just put in one hour a week into slab skills for example and they've been ignoring it all that time that could also be a very very high return but that takes a bit of time you've got to investigate it and work out what you actually need to to put your time into should we do a, a couple of quick examples then so let's go through like maybe four average climbers out there in terms of what they might struggle with if if i say the climber and then you say the solution oh are they famous no 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 oh. famous. we're making them up i don't I only know famous climbers sorry <laughs> Um, so let's say person goes down the wall, really strong, can't, feels much stronger on the fingerboard and pull-ups than all of their friends, but they can't quite climb as well when they're actually bouldering or root climbing. Um, what's a good time efficient exercise for them to be doing? Okay. So what's this guy called? Bob. Uh, let's call him Bob Shipton. Okay. Bob Shipton. So he goes down the wall, he's really strong on pull-ups, fingerboarding and anything really basic. Okay, yeah. But whenever he goes outside, he can't climb that grade that he wants to. Okay, so for him, I would take exercises which have a really high degree of movement-specific skill work. So focus us on stuff where you're actually moving, you're carrying momentum, you're using technique, you're refining your skill sets on the wall. So move him away from those really basic exercises and actually learn how to or improve how you climb. Cool. All right, so let's go for Jen Jameson, next example. So we'll have a female climber. She tends to be really fit on roots. If she can do the moves, she can tend to do the roots. Yeah. Um, and she's relatively flexible, good on crimps, but finds anything particularly burly, quite hard work. Oh, uh, depending on the time of year and where they were in the training season, I would say for this climber is that they would have a really high return from working on some kind of uh, good, solid, rounded strength and conditioning regime for the upper body. So that might not just be the fingers, forearms, arms. It might also be the shoulders and the back. And I think they would feel a lot more solid on steep powerful terrain and be able to lock off hold some of those positions 
and feel stronger on the burly moves. Cool. All right, so... Shall I give you an example? Yeah, yeah go for it. Go for go on, it. Go on, give me a chance. Okay, uh, right, I've got to fit you something really hard. Um, I have a... Ooh, um, I have a crack climber. Yep. This guy is really struggling with his climbing. He looks weak generally. Okay, so immediately he needs to stop running so much. <laughs> okay, no, no. <laughs> okay um, so he's uh, specialised in one form of climbing. Yeah. Uh, it happens to be crack climbing. It's not actually me. I know it sounds like me. Um, and what he is finding is that every session is uh, he's really struggling to access the top end range of quality in his sessions. He's just doing lots of moderate sessions so he never feels like he's stronger or performing better each session cool. so that as well as the specificity this is what i see a lot with root setters people that do a lot of moderate to hard mileage but they don't do a lot of really easy stuff or a lot of really hard stuff so for me it's trying to rather than spending a lot of time in this middle zone of intensity it's spreading it out kind of polarize it a little bit so do the easier sessions need to become slightly easier so the overall workload isn't too much and the harder sessions need to be very, very hard, short and sharp. You need to finish those sessions not in a fatigue state. And that's the hard bit to get people to buy into that are used to this moderate zone is they want to feel tired and fatigued. And that's a sign of a successful session when actually they should be trying really, really hard, powering out, but finish like they feel like they could do more. And when you do that, that's when you're going to make those strength gains. So to access that top end, you need to be trying really, really hard, but finish feeling a little bit fresher. So in this instance, make crack climbing cruxes, but then make it really, really hard, shorter, and then walk away at the end of the session rather than trying to go for longer sequences. Cool. Shall we move on to the next one? I feel like we might have gone through quite a few examples there, but hopefully those are useful, just giving you some specifics and you might identify with some of those climbers yourself or know other people. And I think using those examples is quite a good way to kind of troubleshoot through different types of climbers. And we do this all the time in the office here at work and talk about different types of climbers because I think it really refines your coaching skills and also your self-analysis skills. Cool. So the next question is gonna be a little bit specific. Um, that is, how do you train your index or pinky fingers? So I'm guessing this is from someone who either is really strong on front three or really strong on back three, but feels like the other finger isn't doing much work. I would say generally, the majority of people seem to be stronger on back three, uh, the people that I've worked with, and their index finger tends to feel a little bit weak and it's not too involved. And as soon as that pinky drops off the hold, they suddenly feel a little bit vulnerable, their ring finger's not feeling great and they're not feeling as strong. Mm. The other people tend to find that front three is great and they prefer dragging, or really full crimping and the pinky doesn't seem to do much and they always say that it tends to pop off the hold. So in those two examples, personally I'm uh, the first example of a much stronger pinky finger. In that scenario, I spend a lot of time building the robustness of my ring finger and I have had injuries in the past before I started doing this. So that's working pockets and working grip positions where I've removed the pinky, uh, doing front three holds so that it builds up the robustness of that ring finger and also takes a lot more strain on the index. So my best exercise for that is doing front three half crimp dead hangs on a fingerboard, build up the intensity slowly. As that becomes more comfortable and you feel more used to that position, whenever you start climbing on a board or any boulders where it's a bit more systematic, start using holds where you only do front three in either a full or half crimp um, and it starts building that strength in a realistic zone. For me, Peak District Limestone tends to be quite a lot of front three climbing, and this has really, really helped me over the last few years, and it's helped me prevent uh, any further injuries to those ring fingers that get a little bit vulnerable. I think I probably only have one thing or main thing that I would cover on pinkies versus index is I, I think it's around 2009, 2010, I spent an entire winter season just training my pinky and index uh, for a particular project. And uh, I just wanted to try it out, basically. Um, and I found absolutely no improvement in my grip strength in any of the other positions, whether it was front three, back three, half crimp four, open four, from doing that index and pinky training. 
So for me personally, I found no returns whatsoever by isolating those fingers. But the next year, I then worked on isolated grip positions. In, in particular, what Ollie was just referring to is the front three, back three regime. And I had really, really good results. So that, that was my experience. And I, I invested probably six months into that. One last thing on that is people that really struggle to engage their pinky. And um, one thing you can do is tilt your elbows inwards slightly so that you're talking your hand onto the hold. So it actually means that your pinky gets more room onto that hold. And it's a really good way of creating tension. And if you find that you tend to climb quite straight on, try talking those hands and seeing if it makes a difference whether you can actually engage that pinky. Because it is one of your strongest fingers if you start training it properly. Next question. Uh, do this one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one question we had here was, how much fingerboard training could you or should you do on top of general conditioning? So I think we're referring here to how much fingerboarding would be done by any particular climber on top of the gym work that they would do for, you know, weightlifting, bar work, mm -hmm. core, whatever it might be? Which is a broad question, I think. Yeah, I think the easiest answer to this is it completely depends on how strong your fingers are compared to the rest of your profile. If you've got really, really strong fingers and you can kind of get an idea about that just doing a basic assessment um, or comparing it to friends even, if you get if your strong fingers compared to the rest of your climbing, I would suggest that that fingerboard time needs to be reduced or even potentially eliminated or made into an area where you're trying to build robustness in different grip positions or specifying in grip positions. Whilst if you're weaker compared to your peers or compared to your current grade, then that's when you want to start adding in a lot more fingerboarding where comp uh, compared to the rest of your conditioning. I think the other thing with trying to work out how much fingerboarding you should do in any particular week is also to be really aware of your training and climbing history. So if historically you're a climber, which is that's done three fingerboarding sessions a week for the last three years, then you have a lot of depth at this kind of volume and intensity in your training. So if you want to achieve that overload and stress the body to the point where you're gonna make adaptation, is you need to be aware that that's your training history so you're going to need to overload on top of that. If you're a climber who's never fingerboarded before, it's highly unlikely that going into three weekly high intensity fingerboard sessions a week is appropriate for that climber, unless there's something really unusual about the situation. Um, I'm not going to say that this is going to apply to everyone, but you do want to really pay attention to that training history, that climbing history, because that will inform how much you want to do. And when we talk about overload, we're not talking about, you know, smashing the ball out of the court and going way over the top because you want to make the fastest gains as quick as possible. We're talking about really, really small, incremental, progressive overload on top of what your body is able to cope with. That's, that's the key, isn't it? Lots of people think you just got to go all in. It's, it's just not the way. Yeah. And I think that that's the key thing is everyone tries to jump too quickly. Um, so for me, like to give you another example of like a broad range of thinking about our plans in this question, is I would say every fingerboard session, <clears throat> every fingerboard session that we give to someone, I reckon there's around two to three times as much flexibility work or conditioning or strength training mm. compared to that fingerboard work. So it just kind of shows you how much we focus on the rest of the body compared to the fingers, because you're gonna be working all of that climbing anyway. But your fingers, like Tom said, if you push it too quickly, you just can't take it. And the most frequent injuries are going to occur in the upper body and the fingers. So taking one less session a week is worth it if you don't have any interrupted training because of injury. So two, to, uh, two or three to one of conditioning to fingerboarding, I'd say is a, is a good average to work on. And that conditioning is mobility, strength, um, and all the conditioning work that's going to prevent you from being injured and make you stronger. Cool. Agree. Cool. Uh, so the last question is, how do we choose the coach that a new climber that comes to us will work with? So if we have a new person mm. that comes to us and says, I want a training plan or an assessment, um, how do we choose uh, the coach? Um, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> oh, it's some sort of like roulette spinning or, yeah, or something like that. Roulette. Um, yeah, so I think... The coach allocation and the way in which we work with 
our clients and our athletes. Uh, firstly, is a lot of people aren't always aware that Lattice is a quite a big coaching team and it's far beyond myself and Ollie as the coaches. Um, we have a whole team of coaches here who are all really, really experienced um, athletes themselves. And so when we allocate a athlete or a client, we have a number of people to choose from. And I think another part of that is within this coaching team that is still growing, we also have loads of other experts that come in on board, whether that's researchers, data analysts, uh, filmmakers, um, and all these sort of extra skills helps build the plans even better. But we're not just spread out. We're not working remotely. Um, we're here at the lockup at the moment. We've built an office behind us where all of the coaches come together. So the easiest way to answer this is when you get come to work with us, you'll be working with the whole team because if one person leads that conversation with you, there'll still be the rest of the team there to discuss it with them, to discuss ideas. If you have any in particular queries, then that'll go to the whole team. It won't just be that coach on their own and it'll be a case of working as a big collective to bit, produce the best plan for you. Yeah, yeah. Like a classic example of that was uh, this morning as we were talking about, um, so I was talking to one of our coaches, Jen, um, about one of the clients that she's managing and this uh, climber was asking about crack-specific work and so what happens is in this process is that one of our coaches will find someone else in the team who's a specialist in a certain area. So for, for me, it's a lot of crack climbing and we will sit down and look at the plan and discuss the kind of pros and cons and the methods of how we would work together. And I'll share that knowledge and we'll work as a sort of a duo or collaborate on that um, athlete's training plan to give them the best methods and the most appropriate stuff to make them progress in their climbing. And so everything always tends to be a bit of a, a mixture of the whole team, doesn't it? Where we're all sharing ideas. And I think we've, we've designed the team to, to do that on purpose. So if we see a gap in our knowledge in some area, then we'll always look for that area. Uh, Tom mentioned Jen, who's a competition specialist. Um, we've had a lot more interest from female climbers over the last few years. And I think our team is 50-50. Um, males versus female coaches and that's been fantastic to help with all the areas that they want to talk about in particular so I know that Maddie and Elia are specializing a little bit in how to train around the menstrual cycle and that's something that they've had the time to research into and really get to know very well and they can do that with their clients if one of my clients wants to know that I've now got them on hand to help out with that yeah and, it, and it's really amazing for me and Ollie, because when we first started this, it was just us two and we had to share our knowledge as a duo and that was great. But now that we're a bigger team, it just means that more knowledge, experience, understanding and feedback goes into this ecosystem. So the, the short or the long answer to your question is you will be assigned someone according to your specialization and a coach that's available to be able to take on that person's uh, client's work or training work. But as a whole, you get the whole team, which is awesome. And it's, it's something that we've spent a long time trying to make happen and make work. And it makes the Christmas parties a lot more interesting as well than just me and Tom sitting there with a <laughs> yeah. couple of mince pies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. well uh, hopefully you got a load of useful information from that again. Um, like I said, we're gonna keep doing this as often as we can. It's been a little bit of a, time, a, bit of a break since the last one, but um, keep asking questions and we'll keep doing it. So. Make sure to uh, keep following us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook and get involved in the discussion group and we will speak to you very soon. Yeah, bye.